Shalom from Israel. I'm Shira Sokoram, and I want to welcome you to Israel Frontline, your guide to Israel in the Middle East. We want to give you information you will probably not hear in mainstream media regarding life in Israel and the Israeli-Arab conflict, and we'll add a biblical perspective to our reality. Today, we will begin a four-program series we will look at the historical facts as they really happened, and we will analyze the question, is Israel a legal nation? On the program today, occupied territory, what does it mean? Is the world being fooled, dividing up Palestine? What are the Balfour Declaration and the White Papers? And later, our panel guests, will share their Israeli perspective on Israel's right to exist. There is one phrase that every media network in the world knows and uses, occupied territory. This phrase shapes the orientation and perspective of literally the entire world. In its current meaning of understanding, occupied Palestinian territory means Israel is illegally occupying land that legally belongs to the Arab people. If Israel is illegally occupying Palestinian land, Israel is therefore flouting international law. The implication is Israel then has no legitimate right to the land which she is occupying. And even the state of Israel itself is questionable. Indeed, Palestinians believe Tel Aviv, Haifa, Beersheba, and of course Jerusalem all belong to the Islamic people. It has long been presumed that there is no peace in the Middle East because Israel is building apartments and creating towns, derisively called settlements, in the occupied territory. This rationale concludes that if Israel would just give up her claims to the occupied Palestinian territory, then Arabs would make peace and the earth would be relieved of most of the turmoil generated in the Middle East. This claim is accepted as fact by most of the world. In fact, it is astounding to see how little journalists and politicians know about this part of the world, even if they are stationed here. They often act as if Israel appeared one day, confiscated Arab land, and seized the capital city of the Palestinian nation. However, this is not historical truth, but ideology, Islamic ideology. Every follower of Yeshua, Jesus, needs to know the facts of how the modern state of Israel came into being. So here goes. 3,500 years ago, a man from Ur of the Chaldees, today Iraq, and his family traveled to what was then called Canaan. It was in Canaan that he was told by the God of heaven and earth that the land there would be an inheritance to him and his descendants forever. Of course, what secular journalist in this modern world would accept such a fanciful legal document from God. But fortunately for them, there are other legal treaties and documents from the world that though conveniently ignored by pundits and leaders, do exist and are proof of the international legitimacy and justice to Israel's existence today, no matter what other nations declare. It was just after World War I and the English and French had defeated Germany and its ally, the Turkish Ottoman Empire, whose capital was what is now Istanbul, Turkey. There was nothing left to do but divide up the booty. So even before the war officially ended, Sir Mark Sykes, representing Britain and Francois-George Picot of France, negotiated the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which carved up 
the Ottoman Empire between Britain and France with a bit left for Russia. Britain took the southern part of the Middle East, including the so-called Palestine area, while France took what is called Greater Syria, including Lebanon. Britain also decided to give a bit of Palestine, the Golan Heights, which historically belonged to the Jewish tribe of Manasseh, to France, and France later gave it to Syria. By the way, where did the term Palestine come from? The Romans who ruled over the people of Israel called the land Judea and Galilee. This can be verified on Roman coins. But in the year 135 AD, Roman Emperor Hadrian, who wanted to exterminate every sign of the Jewish people and their land, changed the name to Palestine, taking this word from Israel's ancient enemies, the Philistines. He Latinized it to Palestine and applied it to the whole land of Israel. Hadrian's selection of Palestine was purposeful, not accidental. He hoped to erase the name of Israel from all memory. The Old Testament uses the word Palestine only in reference to the Gaza area where the Philistines used to live. The New Testament never refers to the Holy Land as Palestine. For example, after Yeshua's parents fled to Egypt with the baby Jesus, Yeshua, an angel appeared to Yeshua's father, Joseph, and told him that it was now safe to take the baby back to the land of Israel. It is interesting to note that the original Philistines were not Middle Eastern at all. They were European peoples from the Adriatic Sea next to Greece, and they are now extinct. In any case, the original Palestinians had nothing to do whatsoever with the, any Arabs. In today's mumbo jumbo about the Palestinian people, here are historical facts that you must always keep in mind. There has never ever been an Arab Palestinian state. There has never been an Arab Palestinian people until Yasser Arafat and the PLO created them in the early 1960s. The Palestinian people have no holidays celebrating national events, only protest days against Israel. No nation has ever claimed Jerusalem as their capital in the centuries after the Jewish people were expelled by the Romans in 70 AD. That is, no one until Israel proclaimed the new Jerusalem as her capital and then recaptured ancient Jerusalem in 1967 and incorporated the entire city as Israel's ancient capital that will never be divided again. It is only after Israel announced to the world that she had returned to her ancient capital that Arabs decided ancient Jerusalem would be their capital. But let's return to the two colonial powers, Britain and France. They began divvying up the former Ottoman Empire according to the pressures and the considerations at the time. Fortunately for the Jewish people, during World War I, a prominent scientist, Dr. Chaim Weizmann, discovered a new process to produce acetone used in the manufacture of explosives, a discovery that greatly helped Britain's war effort. This innovation encouraged Britain's Foreign Secretary, Arthur Balfour, to issue the Balfour Declaration of 1917, the modern foundational basis for Israel's legitimate rights to Palestine as her Jewish homeland. There followed a number of treaties and covenants that affirmed the Balfour Declaration, first by the forerunner of the UN, the League of Nations, secondly, the San Remo Conference, and finally, the United Nations, which voted to accept Israel as a member nation of the UN. During the years after World War I and throughout World War II, 
When millions of Jews were dying in gas chambers, the Arab peoples of the Middle East fought with all their might to keep Jews out of their Jewish homeland. Britain, understanding that there were many more Arabs than Jews and needing them to fight alongside them against the Ottoman Turks, mostly caved in to Arab violence, riots, and political demands. Soon after World War I, in 1922, Winston Churchill came up with a plan that he thought might work. When the Arabs demanded that he rescind the Balfour Declaration, he replied in his 1922 White Paper, which is a British policy paper, that he could not do that. The Balfour Declaration stands. However, to appease the Arabs, he arbitrarily took the land under the British mandate east of Jordan River, 76% of what had been promised as a homeland to the Jews, and gave it to the son of a Saudi ruler, and ordered that Jews could no longer settle or live there. Thus Jordan came into being. This was a betrayal of the full promise of the Balfour Declaration. But Churchill thought it worthwhile in that Britain could then reserve for the Jews, the remaining 24% of Palestine, which was west of the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Churchill was seen as a friend to Jewish people. The Arabs gladly took the land on the east bank of the Jordan River, but continued to launch terrorist attacks against the Jews over the remaining 24% meant for a Jewish homeland. In response to the continuous violence, another white paper was written in 1930 by the British government, stating that it now seemed necessary to limit the number of Jews immigrating to any place in the Holy Land because they were taking jobs away from the Arab population. Now it is well known fact that everywhere the Jews lived, they built up the economy and actually gave Arabs new jobs. The truth is, where Jews lived, Arabs were also attracted to move in because of the job opportunities. And the British wanted to prevent Arab violence at all costs. In 1939, exactly at the beginning of the destruction of six million Jews in Europe, the British sent out a third white paper allowing only 10,000 Jews a year into Palestine for the next five years. And after that, the Arabs could decide on whether more Jews would be allowed into Palestine. Thus, during World War II, the Jews were denied a safe haven from the Nazi butchers. The British sense of justice collapsed under the weight of Arab terrorism and obstinacy. Meanwhile, Britain had given Mesopotamia independence in 1932 and called it Iraq. France gave Lebanon her independence in 1943 and Syria in 1946. If you remember, Britain had created the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan in 1922 when it gave 76% of the promised land to a son of a ruler from Mecca. Jordan was then granted complete independence in 1946. Still, Israel was given no country of her own because of the constant violence of the Arabs who were determined that no Jews would create a state in the middle of so-called Arab territory. Finally, Britain had had enough and threw up her hands, handing the mess over to the League of Nations and its successor, the United Nations. Next week, we're going to dig deeper into the declarations and resolutions of Britain and the United Nations that promised Israel a homeland for the Jewish people. Stay tuned. We will be back with our panel of guests 
and their Israeli perspective on these issues. The Bible is full of promises to the Jewish people, promises of physical and spiritual restoration. But how do these promises relate to today's reality in Israel and the Middle East? In addition to the Israeli side of the story, the Ma'oz Israel Report ties in the biblical perspective with what is happening in the region. Subscribe to receive this free publication at ma'ozisrael.org slash sign up. We will also send you the digital version of Ari's book, To the Jew First, when you sign up. Welcome back. We will now turn to a discussion with our panel and get their Israeli perspective on Israel's right to exist. Today in the studio with us are Liz Goldstein from Maoz Media, Bati Shoshani, Director of Operations for TBN Israel from Jerusalem, and Shani Ferguson, co-founder of Yeshua Israel Ministries, also from Jerusalem. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you. It's great to be here. Mati, I want to ask you a question. Britain published the Balfour Declaration, declaring that she would look with favor upon the creation of a Jewish state. This was in 1917. Over the next few years, and certainly over 30 years, the attitude towards the Jewish state changed radically. What in the world happened there with Britain? Definitely. There were two main events that shaped one, the Balfour Declaration, and then sort of the shift out of that attitude towards the Jewish people, or the idea of the Jewish state. The first one was that prior to 1917, so at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a movement of pro-Zionism in the church in England. So it was a theological thing, and you can see that in the writings of Benjamin de Israeli, the Prime Minister of, of, the, of Britain at the time, or the British Empire at the time, was religiously pro the idea of a Jewish state for the Jewish people going back to the biblical idea. So that's a big, big part of that. The idea of their positive sentiment towards the Jewish people in Israel is rooted in their reading into the Bible right. in that way. If, if the beginning, if the positive sentiment was because of their religious roots or their belief in the Bible, that switching was also rooted in that. They switched from a very religious government to a more pragmatic and secular government. Mm -hmm. And some of the circumstances, just to give the, the to get a, a background understanding, the empire was undergoing very hard financial times. And they, once they assumed control of what is now known as Israel and the region, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and some of the other countries in the area, they realized they have a very expensive problem on their hands. There are a lot of people, indigenous people, who want their own country, want their own place, and they have to police them. They have to control all these mutinies and rebellions going on. Mm -hmm. And they realized most of the people are against the Jews. Mm -hmm. So going with the Jews is going to cost them a lot. They're going to have to send manpower over to the region. Right. They're going to have to start siding with them. So it was, it's also pragmatic, but at the same time, it was also a religious mm -hmm. change of heart. Shani, do you think the falling apart, the disintegration of the empire of Britain had any connection with their attitude, their changing attitude towards the Jewish people? I think if you can accept that there is such a possibility, that there is a consequence to your actions, spiritual consequence to your action, then you can accept the fact that historically nations that have turned against Israel have quickly deteriorated. So I would say that it follows the pattern of history that when a nation or an empire mm -hmm. turns against Israel in a harsh way, even if you could say, well, potentially it was some sort of judgment on Israel or whatever, inevitably God then turned um, and punished the nation that was Right. I remember my father saying over and over again, uh, Britain went into World War II with an empire where the sun never set, right? That's what mm -hmm. they used to say. And at the end of the war, there was almost nothing left of it. And I, I just somehow think there's a connection there, a spiritual connection between the rejection of the Jewish people when they could have really done something. Britain could have done something that nobody else and could have done. And not just Britain. If you look at the Europe and the countries that did so much evil to the Jewish people were, in, were just complete rubble by the end of, the, of World War II. Mm -hmm. And the countries that 
rescued the Jews, like right. America, then had their glory years right afterwards. Liz, you know, if you talk about the man on the street in Britain, do you think they have any understanding of Britain's uh, way of looking at the Jewish people during all of this, this last century? I think they really, I don't think they do. I think they really are more um, aware of what they receive in media and how things are portrayed to them by um, the news, the BBC, whoever it is that right. whatever voice they're hearing, they're, they're listening to that and absorbing it, not necessarily investigating the facts of what happened. I don't think many of them are aware of the different um, documents that you mentioned earlier in the program, like the Balfour Declaration, and I don't think that Which they Which is astounding, you know, it came from their history. How do you think the British people are looking right now? How, how are they looking at Israel? The UK, like much of Europe, is sort of has fallen under this very limited thought process of thinking about all these events in a very simplistic way. And they're unaware of the background of that. They're unaware of the spiritual roots of it. They're unaware of the political or historical roots. And they sort of think in this, you know, just present day circumstances without any tie to the past. So you mentioned it's true. You know, they're, they're, not, thinking, they're not thinking about what happened in the past. And they're not thinking about the process leading to it. And they're, very, they're not aware of the influences on them, the Islam in their country, the secularism right. in their country, the fact that the church is sort of something you mock, the values of the church too. Uh, something you look down on and they're not aware of the processes that happen that shapes entirely shapes the way they look at everything happening here in this land because they're looking at it through that very limited scope so do you think the BBC uh, is leading the British people uh, to really be very anti-Israel or do you think the BBC is just representative of the whole British people well, that prob the BBC probably, is probably both. Television usually caters to the taste of their audience. Mm -hmm. But in, in the UK's version, or in the BBC's uh, case, uh, looking back to uh, Operation Pillar of Defense, it was actually in Tel Aviv the day, you know, right downtown, the day everything started. And I put on the news, it was Sky News. And what I'm watching there is, you know, they have one after the other, you know, it's like teenagers in their house telling their first hand story. But it's, you know, there's no record or factual uh, reporting or anything like that. No, no pictures of what's going on outside. What teenagers were you talking these about? These are these are inside the Gaza Strip. Okay. And the, so their their reporting was very limited to this one voice with right. this one message, and it's not even a question of it's just bad journalism. Exactly. They just, they just have this you know narrow story. They're mm -hmm. just you know constantly tapping into that. If you watch television, you would expect that's the story. Right. But they don't have any other way of of learning about it. So Shani. When, let's say, the BBC or Sky was broadcasting about the war that happened last summer, uh, they acted like uh, they couldn't get news about the terrorists themselves. And so they just showed victims. Do you, why do you think that they didn't really follow through? Okay, if they, if they couldn't get to, to anybody who was shooting rockets, at least they could have said something, but they didn't. I think that the journalists, again, and we've discussed this before, are scared uh, to report of what is happening when you have such aggressive terrorists. I, I actually have that some uh, peace activists that came to Israel and they were protesting, you know, whatever, walking the highway and saying, you know, Israel, a bunch of whatever. And the journalist said, why don't you go over to Syria and protest because they're killing hundreds of thousands of people they're, they're killing more people in the last you know, two years than Israel has had in, bo in wars on both sides and since it's become a nation in 1948. And they said, are you kidding me? Syria's dangerous. Like, <laughs> clearly, in their mind, like, Israel is this fun place where you can just yeah. go and, like, complain about something that you really don't understand. Exercise your democratic muscles. Yeah. Right, and they know it's a democratic country, and they know they can walk up and down the street. And so Britain, which has all of this history that we, we know, that we've talked about, do you think that they are more anti-Israel than other European countries or just the same across Europe? Anybody? I think you could actually say that the, the deadness of the church is very all over Europe and it's paralleled with their dislike for Israel and you generally see that anywhere in the world where the church is not alive, when the church becomes alive just like in 1917 when the Balfour Declaration, it was a reflection of the church becoming alive, getting revelation and praying is this amazing declaration right. into being. So Liz, what do you think will happen to Europe 
in the long run because now Europe is across the board turning against Israel. What do you think God is going to do with Europe and Britain? Well, I just I wanted to respond a little bit to the previous question that you asked Shanine. Go ahead. And I think that um, Britain, they are kind of, I don't know if they're more anti-Israel, I think they're in the middle and it's similar to the stance that they took even in 1948 when they abstained from the vote to the UN and it's just as destructive as being for or against to be in the middle. I mean in the Bible we also read that it doesn't please God when we're lukewarm. And I don't know in what way, what will be the fruit yeah. of it, but I don't think it's a, right. they have a positive um, future. What start. it looks to me like is that there is going to be slowly but surely a Islamic takeover of Europe as the population grows uh, to... Know, we've country. seen sort of a reactionary movement to exactly that problem. You know, people are only willing to be politically cor correct to a certain point, and that point has come in many European countries. So we've seen a lot of them sort of coming up, no, no, we don't actually don't like any strangers, we want to, you know, go back to the old land, whatever it is. The UK, Germany, France, each one of them has reacted in a very aggressive way to that uh, right. mentality. Every move of God has a sound, has a song, has its own music. Mao's Music Making for Kids program was created to help raise up a new generation of talented musicians in the body of Messiah in Israel. We want to give the children of today the tools to grow and excel in music so that they can create the new music relevant to reaching their generation. Our hope is that they will be able to speak to the world through music and tell others about their faith in Messiah Yeshua. That's it for today's Israel Frontline. Thank you for watching, and we hope we were able to give you insight which will help you understand and pray for Israel in a more focused way. For more articles about Israel, Sign up to the free Maoz Israel report at maozisrael.org slash sign up. We will be back next week with another episode of Israel Frontline. Please join us for the second of the four-part series discussing the legality of Israel as a nation. We will examine different documents, some of which are little known, supporting the right of this country to exist. On behalf of all of us at Israel Frontline, blessings and shalom from Tel Aviv.